five questions to ask before doing a word study. Stop. Before you do any word study, you need to ask yourself five questions. Now, I posted a few videos on the value of biblical software a while ago, and they generated a lot of interest. So I thought I'd do a series on how to do word studies using software and other resources. If you're new to the channel, this is the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris. I've been teaching at seminaries for the past 20 to 30 years, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and make it available to anyone, anywhere on the internet. And it's been incredible to receive messages and feedback from you guys from all over the world. Thanks. But if you haven't done so yet, please do me a favor and it costs you nothing at all. Hit the subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up if you like it. That way YouTube will help others know about this channel. Thank you very, very much. So, without any further faffing about, let's dive into it. Before you do a word study, you want to ask yourself a couple basic questions that will save you a lot of time and energy. In this video, we're going to look at how to decide which words you're going to spend your precious time, energy, and money on. You don't want to study every word in a passage. It would just take too much time and your time is valuable. Work, family, seminary, and other studies, plus bicycling, all put heavy demands on your time. So how do you decide where you're going to spend your precious time when you're studying the Bible and doing word studies? I'm going to give you five pointers that will help you make this decision. Quick word of disclaimer at the very start. When I show examples on the screen, I'll be using Accordance software. As I said in previous videos, this is mainly because I've been using it for over 20 years and I know it best. And just in case you're wondering, I'm not sponsored by Accordance but you can do the same thing on Lagos, Altree, and some of the free software packages as well, and see my video on the best free software packages. Why do I recommend software? Because it's much better, much faster, and you're gonna get more powerful results and deeper results than using printed books for this type of study. Whoa! Mr. Groggy went rogue on me there. Sorry about that. Here are five questions that I teach my students in my seminary and other courses to ask that are going to help you get the riches in your studies a lot quicker. And I'm going to have a bonus question at the very end. Number one, look for words that are theologically loaded. This is especially true for words which you think you may already know a great deal about. For example, in Matthew 8, 2, we have the passage that reads, a leper approached and bowed down before him saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus touches him and commands him, be clean. And Matthew tells us that the leper was cleansed, not healed. Clean does not just mean something that is all washed up and spotless. It is a term that is theologically and culturally loaded from the Old Testament and the ceremonial cleansing and purity rituals within the Jewish religions. The idea of cleanliness is not limited to the Hebrew scriptures, but was found in most religions in the ancient Near East. Birth, death, and certain injuries or illness or discharges associated with sexuality were seen as making someone unclean and hence impure. This then required some form of purification to make them clean again. If someone were involved in some sort of act or action involving a ritual or a god or a temple, that state of impurity would be seen as an offense against that god. In the Hebrew scriptures, this gets metaphorically extended to moral impurity and cleansing as well. So both physical and moral impurities before God made a person impure, and both needed to be cleansed to restore their standing before God and within that religious community. Uncleanliness and Yahweh were seen as polar opposites in the Old Testament. Matthew's leper is not asking just to be healed, but something much more. To be cleansed of his leprosy not only would involve the removal of the symptoms of his illness, being healed, but a purification from these impurities associated with it so that he can participate in the religious community that he lives in once again and worship within the religious life of Israel. This is a huge concept within the Bible, and it's beyond the scope of this quick example to illustrate this point much further. Take a look at the notes in study Bibles about the meaning of a word. 
These short little notes can often let you know if you want to spend your time on this word or not, or if it's interesting. They might be giving you a heads up that there's some real gold to be mined here. Number two, words that are culturally loaded. Now this is going to take some growing familiarity with the culture in which the New Testament and the Old Testament authors lived. For example, in Galatians 3.28, Paul writes, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now in Greco-Roman culture, the division between slave or free, male and female, were perhaps the most important distinctions between people culturally. You are either a person or a possession, a free person or a slave. You were either a man or a woman. And a woman was often not even seen as being close to the level of man or what it meant to be a man. When Paul speaks about women or wives, how did the people within the culture of his day view them? What types of connotations and cultural values were attached to these words? We really miss how big some of these distinctions are unless we kind of put it in the terms of migrants who are coming into the United States without the proper documentation or through the proper channels. The way some Americans view them is kind of the way that Jew and Greek, male and female, free and slave were viewed during that day. Now, if you find these suggestions and tips for doing word studies useful and beneficial, please subscribe to the channel and YouTube will let you know when I post new videos. Number three, words which serve as the dominant themes within a passage. You can often spot these because they are repeated or used in clusters with other synonyms. For example, in John, the themes of light and dark run through the entire book. It starts in chapter 1-4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. You can see very, very quickly there that this theme of light is carried throughout John's Gospel, and it's an important one. Another example of this is in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus comes to see Jesus. The only thing we know about the entire setting there is that it was nighttime, it was dark. And here we have Nicodemus, a man, in the darkness of night, coming to meet the light of the world. Number four, words that make a significant impact on how you understand the meaning of that passage. Once again, the notes in a study Bible might tip you off to it. See what they're commenting on. If you're looking at commentaries, commentaries will often offer the same clues. See what words they spend a lot of time on and explaining. And especially if you look in more than one commentary or study Bible, look at the words that they disagree or they're arguing over. These are often the words that are going to have a big impact on a passage. Number five, words that have more significance than meets the eye. As we saw in the third question, John loves to do this type of thing in his gospel. In John chapter 1, he introduces the theme of light and dark. And then he plays off that idea throughout his whole gospel. Now, you're not going to learn a great deal about the definition of what light and dark is, but rather you're going to see how he uses these words throughout his gospel as a theme. Or you could look at the book of Jonah. The author there loves to use the ideas of going up, or going down to communicate his message. When things are going up, we have a positive trend. When things go down, it signals a negative trend. In Jonah 1-2, God tells Jonah to immediately get up and go to Nineveh and pronounce a judgment on the city. But in verse 3, the Net Bible translates it this way. Instead, Jonah immediately headed off to Tarshish to escape from the commission of the Lord. He traveled to Joppa and found a merchant ship heading to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went aboard it to go with them to Tarshish, far away from the Lord. He traveled to Joppa, literally as he went down to Joppa. And if you did a word study, you would find that the Hebrew word here, to go down, is the verb yirad, to go down. So what you say, if he goes down from the mountains of Israel to the coast, then he would naturally be going downhill to Joppa on the coast. But notice how this word is used repeatedly in the passage. It is used a second time in 1.3. And he went aboard, is literally, and he went down into the ship. In 1.5, we are told that he went down into the cargo hold. 
This downward journey culminates in chapter 2, verse 6, where Jonah says, I have gone down to the very bottoms. Going down and going up are basic actions, but studying their use in Jonah helps us to see how the author uses these two verbs as a theme in his little book to convey a message. Bonus question. This is what you've all been waiting for, right? The bonus question is this. What words catch your curiosity? They just catch your attention. There's no particular rhyme or reason to it. They just jump off the page at you. Now, there's nothing wrong in studies like these. In fact, a lot of times I find that when I study a word just because it's captured my attention, these are the words and the definitions that I tend to remember the most. There's a lot to be said for that type of study. I hope that this video has given you some good questions to ask and lines to run along as you study the Bible. If you found this useful, be sure to subscribe and give it a thumbs up. Also, stay tuned for the next video, which is going to look at the mechanics of how to do a word study. I'll have a link to it up over here. Click on the image down here to see the video that the AI geniuses at YouTube think you would like to watch next. Until we meet again, peace.